Thank you very much for joining us at um, the virtual Trinity Centre for Literary and Cultural Translation. You're, you're here to listen to John Banville in conversation. And just before we start, I'd like to quickly run through some technical um, points. So if you would, I'm sorry, if you would like to alter the volume, <laughs> You can do that in the bottom left hand corner of the screen just here on audio settings and if you'd like to ask the panelists a question then you can do that at the q a um, uh, button just there so without any further ado i'll pass you over to michael cronin who's our um uh, 1776 professor of french thank you very much Hello, uh, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, our uh, discussion uh, this evening, which is part of a series of, of talks uh, with uh, writers and uh, translators uh, about uh, the art of literature and, and translation. Um, this evening, we're particularly uh, pleased to have uh, John Banville, uh, who is a patron uh, of the Trinity Centre for Literary and Cultural uh, Translation. Uh, and my guest this evening uh, was uh, described by uh, Edmund White uh, in 2017 in The Guardian as one of the best uh, novelists uh, in English, who has a long and distinguished uh, writing career going from Long Lankin in 1970 uh, to uh, Mrs. Uh, Osmond in 2017, writing as, as John Banville. Uh, John Banville is the holder of, of numerous uh, prizes, the, including the Man Booker Prize, for The Sea in 2005, uh, the Kafka Prize, the Prince of Asturias uh, Prize for uh, Literature. He's a fellow uh, of the uh, Royal Society of Literature and a Cavaliere uh, in the uh, Ordine della Stella d'Italia. Um, he uh, also writes uh, under the pseudonym uh, Benjamin Black, um, crime novels. Uh, a number of these novels have been adopted uh, for uh, television. Uh, and uh, his uh, most uh, recent work as uh, B.W. Black uh, is The, uh, the Secret uh, Guess. Um, so, um, John, um, I'd like to very much uh, welcome you um, to our conversation this evening. Uh, we would have liked to have you uh, in uh, a living visual form, but unfortunately, because of our, our technical difficulties, um, you have been represented by uh, a telephone icon on the screen, but we can hear uh, your voice, and um, I hope you can, you can hear mine. Yes, I can. I can hear you loud and clear, even though I'm on the dark side of the moon, obviously. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, um, you can signal to to our version of Houston if there's a if if there's a, a further problems. Um, uh, John, I want to begin, um, I, I suppose, our, our conversation this evening uh, with a question about um, the the role or the the, the importance that that translated. Uh, literature or, or foreign literature uh, in translation uh, had for you in your kind of your, your formative re years as a reader uh, or as a, a, a writer? Were, were there particular kinds uh, of uh, writers, particular languages that, that, that loomed large in your reading apprenticeship? Well, I must begin by saying that I feel a complete fraud since I haven't got languages. Um, when I was young, I thought there was plenty of time, and I would learn them eventually. <laughs> now I haven't got plenty of time, and I still haven't learned them. Um, literature and translation was, of course, immensely important for me, since um, I was determined from an early age that I wouldn't be merely an Irish writer, that I would be a, a great European figure. I would be a European novelist of ideas. Um, I had read too much of Thomas Mann and Hermann Broch and so on. Um, but yes, I mean, reading Thomas Mann, reading, uh, you know, translated work was immensely important for me. It was a window onto a wider world. John McGarren used to say that he could imagine a wonderful cartoon 
where we're both struggling at a window and I'm trying to open a window on Europe and he's trying to slam it shut. <laughs> so, so, but one thing that's, that's, that's very, uh, I mean, even the writers that you, 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 you've mentioned there, uh, John, I mean, Thomas Mann, uh, Hermann Brock, uh, there's, there's, there's Rilke, it turns up in, the, in this, the science trilogy, you know, Nietzsche in the Book of Evidence. Um, there's, there, there seems to be a, a strong uh, attraction to uh, translated literature from, from German. Is that, is that simply the kind of a, just the, the, the accident of your, your reading life or were you particularly drawn to, to something that, that you found in, in, in German writing? No, I've always been drawn to the weight and seriousness of, of German literature. Um, I remember listening to Radio 3, BBC Radio 3, my goodness, it must be 40, 50 years ago. And there was an interval talk, which was the reading of uh, Hoffman Stahl's uh, Letter of Lord Chandos and being absolutely bowled over by this extraordinary document, which I hadn't known before and which uh, again opened that, that casement onto the world. Um, then I began to read Kleist, Kleist's absolutely pivotal essay on the marionette theatre. Uh, these, were, these were key texts for me uh, in the kind of late modernism that I was attempting to do. So was it the, the, the fact that these were, were, were writers who, if you like, presented um, a full version of a human, both the, 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 the feeling human, but also the, 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 the thinking human, that, that, that ideas or the intellect were just as emotional or... or oh, yes, it was, a, it, was, it, was, it was a great discovery that literature could be, as I said, weighty and serious and also passionate. Um, when I discovered Rilke's poetry, um, again, I was astonished at the the, the weight of emotion in it, and yet the artistic control. This is the essence of art for me. I think that I feel that the artist has a duty to think in some form uh, in art, but uh, thinking always has to give way or give equal uh, place to the passions, to the emotions. Mm -hmm. You know, a dead work of art is a dead work of art. Hmm. And in, in, say, for example, somebody that I know, I know you've you've you've, you've, you've written about, I mean, uh, Claudia Magris's uh, Danube. I mean, uh, did you find in, in Magris that 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 kind of alliance again between maybe uh, art and feeling, or 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 or, or a notion of the a way of of, of crafting a st story? In, in his case, partly. Yes, story. I first. Yeah, I, I, I first. I hadn't heard of Claudio, Margaret. I was books editor in the Irish Times in the nineties. My secretary had a rule, which was absolutely true, that the worst books came in the best packaging. The best books came in the worst packaging. Uh, you know, you would spend ten minutes, you know, on strapping a book from its cardboard and binding and so on, you discover that it was dieting for cats or something. Uh, Claudio's book came in a rather scrubby, thrice-used jiffy bag. And uh, I read the first couple of pages and I, you know, again, I had discovered a world. Uh, I've since become friends with Claudio and so on, but I've never forgotten that the, the astonishment and the, the thrill of reading that book. Uh, it's still uh, a wonderful book. Unfortunately for Claudio, it's, it's, it's his best book. One should never write one's best book that early. <laughs> but I mean, it's only his best book because who could, who could write anything better? You know, somebody once asked, um, who was it who wrote Catch-22? And Joseph Heller he said, you know, Mr. Heller, you, you, you've never really written anything better than Catch-22, have you? And Heller said, yeah, and who has? <laughs> and, and, and did you, you know, I mean, you, you mentioned the fact that, 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 you know, when you were literary editor uh, in, the, in the Irish Times, I mean, were you conscious of the fact that, you know, as a literary editor, the one of the things that, that you could do was, was to, to bring 
translated literature to the attention of your 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 Irish readership or your Irish uh, audience? Um, or very much so, but but I found to my horror that week on week, month on month, year on year, fewer and fewer books were appearing uh, in translation. Uh, there is something about the Anglophone world. world. Um, we, uh, we we can't be doing this, all this foreign stuff. Shadow and Windows, I remember, was a, a really wonderful house for publishing uh, European fiction in translation. Uh, no more. Uh, you know, I'm sure there are certain people in Penguin, uh, I know a few of them who are desperately trying to 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 sell uh, foreign literature and translation too, and they are publishing it. But you know, if it doesn't sell, they won't be able to keep publishing. But there are passionate people still. But the public just doesn't seem to want uh, foreign literature. Eileen Battersby, uh, the critic in the Irish Times, the late much lamented Eileen, uh, she was a champion of of translated literature, and she brought every week she would bring, practically every week she would bring a new name to the attention of reading, Irish Times readers. Uh, she was wonderful at that, and she's, she's sorely missed for many reasons, but that's one of the reasons she's missed for. So yes, I mean, translation is it's the lifeblood of literature, uh, but I don't know, for instance, what's going on in, you know, literature about a Mongolia, what's going on in Siberian literature, what's going on, because it's it's not being translated now. I don't know, there were, I were very <clears throat> many books about Mongolia published in English, but you know what I mean, mm-hmm. that uh, I don't even know what's going on in French literature anymore. Um, German literature, I don't know. I know a bit, but not much. So this is, this is a shame, this is dangerous, it's dangerous well beyond the boundaries uh, that we're talking about uh, into the wider social and political world. It is disastrous that uh, English is becoming the lingua franca of the world. It's becoming the bloody Esperanto. And uh, it's getting almost as bad as Esperanto as well. It's becoming so adulterated. But then I have to say that the great power and strength of the English language is the fact that it is an adulterated language. It's an impure language. That's one of the things I love in German, that it is so pure. Uh, Italian, French, these are pure. Um, uh, English isn't. As I say, it's, it's, it is the strength of it, but also its weakness because, you know, it's been de- debased into a kind of uh, patois now. And it has to be, you know, if it's going to be used, if English is going to be used in in Moscow and in Washington and in Tokyo and in Beijing and going to be used as the language, then of course it's going to become a dark mm. And it's going to become flattened. That's my worry. So good translations, you know, from uh, well-written foreign literature is absolutely vital. But I see very little of it nowadays. Outside, as I say, wonderful houses like Pushkin Press, Penguin, uh, Notting Hill editions, uh, they are still valiantly trying to bring foreign literature to our attention. Sorry, yes, there's so, a hobby horse. I know. Mount. Yeah, I mean, I think there is there is hope in, in that you, you do get some of the smaller houses like uh, Fitzgeraldo, um, who published Olga yeah. I mean, that they're beginning to uh, make kind of an impression and, 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 and bring writers to the fore. And, and I suppose some of the kind of the, the, the fiction prizes, you know, the um, Man Book Prize for International uh, Fiction, the Guards and Foreign Fiction, they, they do bring uh, attention to, but of course it's against a, a context where it's between two and three percent of, of literature published in English is, uh, is translated literature, so very, very yeah. low. Um, well, yeah. One of the the, the um, things that I, I wondered about because we, we've talked um, so far about the you know literature in in, in translation your own experience uh, of that literature as as, as a reader uh, your relation to shift to it as uh, a literary editor, how, how you see it in, in terms of the kind of the global politics of kind of uh, openness uh, or, or, or shutting down. What, what about your own relationship 
to translators them, themselves, because you, you, your work has been been widely uh, translated. Um, I mean, d d do you have um, regular contacts with your translators? Do do they they send queries to no. you? <clears throat> no, the, the, no. The short answer is no. I don't. Um, I'll tell you a little anecdote. Um, it's been amusing me for years. In one of my books, the Infinities, I think it must have been the Infinities. Um, I wrote a sentence, the God is speaking and he's complaining of how he and his fellow gods are being compelled to do things by mere human beings. And he says, um, fine gods we are that we must muster to a mortal must. Mm -hmm. I remember when I wrote that sentence thinking, my God, what did my translators make of it? So a few years later, I spoke to one of my translators, I won't say which one, obviously. And I mentioned this. I said, you know, what on earth did you do with that sentence? Because the book had just been translated. And the translator said, uh, oh, I don't remember that one. Um, so I thought, oh, God. Mm -hmm. If the translator didn't notice that sentence, then I think the translator must have been working as we did when we were children and learning to read when we skipped the hard words. I think that hard sentence must simply have been skipped. So God only knows what, what happens to my, my, I mean, I spoke to, uh, uh, my wife spoke to a couple of uh, Japanese people who moved to our, she asked if they, because a couple of my books have been translated to Japanese. And they said, oh yes, yes, we read, we read them in Japanese. And then we read them when we came here, read them in English. And I have to tell you that the two bear absolutely no relation to each other. The Japanese translator just wrote some book of his own um, so, what am I to do? How am I to know? Yeah, I don't. Uh, we, yes, we, we've yeah. no control. You know, mm. you know the, the, the story about John Brains, working class novel in the 1950s, Room at the Top, mm. which is translated into, I think, Swedish as The Attic. Um, I can perfectly understand it. I can perfectly understand the mistake. A friend of mine told me he was speaking to this Italian translator about one of his poems which had. Uh, the word silverfish in it, you know, the little insects that run about. And uh, he said to the turns, well, what do you think silverfish are? I said, well, you know, things like sea bass and that, so silverfish. Again, how is he to know? How is he to recognize it just because the two words run together that he wasn't talking about silverfish? So I would rather not, I mean, reading a translation of one's work, I remember reading the first paragraph of one of my books in French, and I'm told that my French translator is absolutely superb. But I was reading this first paragraph, and I thought, my God, this is like being visited one, by one's granny's ghost. You know, I barely recognize it. I'm not saying it was bad. It was probably good. In fact, my Italian publisher gets a wistful look in his eye. I think he thinks five translations into Italian are better than the, than the originals, which may be true for all I know. Um, but you see my point that I, I can't know. Mm. I can't know how the, how the books are, and I don't want to know. Now, Volkov and his missus used to get out the Swedish dictionary and the Japanese dictionary, you know, when one of his translations came in. I haven't got the Volkov's linguistic skills or his tenacity, or his wife's tenacity. Mm. Yes, I mean... I feel, I feel I should say over and out at the end to reach these answers. <laughs> 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 no, but I, I suppose, uh, is there a sense in which that the uh, translations in some ways are, are rather similar to, I mean, the, the books that, that, that you write, I mean, that, that once you've written them, that's it, you, you sort of let go of them and then they, they make their own life and um, you, you can't really be, you know, you're, you're no longer responsible uh, for them. Is, 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 is there that sense as well? I mean, just to just let go and see what, what, what kind of career it makes for itself. It's a, bit like, it's a bit like selling one of one's books to for screen adaptation. Mm. You, you know, it's going to become a different thing. Um, you know, writers who moan about, whine about their books being butchered when they're turned into screenplays. That's what happens, you know. Um, it's a different medium. If you had a, a, a novel, uh, translated onto the screen, word to word, sentence, sentence, it would be gibberish, you know. 
you know, Wittgenstein said about a lion, that, you know, if a lion could speak, we wouldn't understand what he was saying. Um, you know, it, it's the same thing. You, 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 can't, you can't transliterate, you cannot transfer a thing, a work of art, uh, even a failed work of art, although they always say that the best movies are made from the worst novels. Um, I, this is how I comfort myself in the fact that none of mine has ever been made into a good movie. Um, I can't know. I go back to saying I can't know what the translations are like. Over and out. One of the, um, I mean, the experiences that 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 you had, and I, I know you just you, you describe them as 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 versions, but of you know translation uh, adaptation. Um, was your 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 work uh, on the adaptation into English of three plays by uh, Heinrich von Kleist? I know you you just you, you mentioned briefly um, earlier, um, and the, the the particular importance of the 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 the, the, the essay on on on, on puppets uh, uh, from from Kleist. But, um, I suppose the the, the 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 first question because you know it, it does stand out of these these group of plays that you've uh, adapted into uh, English, uh, you know, why, why Kleist? What was the, the particular, um, I suppose, importance or significance of, of oh, Kleist? Oh, well, that, hearing, he, hearing that, uh, the Shandos letter, I brief, on BBC Radio 3, that led me to Kleist, um, and I discovered in Kleist a world. Um, I mean, he's, he's hardly known in English-speaking world. I can't remember the last time I saw a Kleist play being put on, apart from my own versions. Uh, and their versions are not translations. I haven't got enough German for that. But a German friend of mine gave me a great compliment. He read them and he said, my God, how did you do this? It sounds just like Kleist. Uh, I took that as a, as, a, as a wonderful compliment. Um, so I was working in darkness and in ignorance. Maybe that sextance, you know, that's what he did himself. Uh, Kleist, I regard as one of the great figures in European literature. Uh, he said himself he would tear the laurel wreath from Goethe's brow. Um, I think he succeeded in doing that. It's just that not many people noticed. Uh, in The Infinities, my novel, The Infinities, which takes place in an alternative universe, I have Kleist as the central German literary figure, you know, towering over such pygmies as Schiller and so on. I enjoyed doing that. Um, Open One thing that I, that that um, you know, when you did the the, the, the versions uh, of um, so, uh, uh, becomes uh, God's gift, um, and then the the, the, the broken jug. Um, you situate uh, God's gift in Ireland in in 1798, in the, the, the year of the rebellion, and the broken jug is set in the Irish famine. Um, uh, I mean, when when you did that, was that because you were working on conscious sort of historical parallels, or was it more to do with with the mood, with it? A sense of crisis that wasn't really linked to a specific uh, historical uh, event. Well, I did. I did those versions of the Kleist plays as a labour of love and a labour of duty. I wanted to get Kleist onto the stage in an English-speaking country. You know, it's only a little country like ours. Um, I find it incomprehensible that Kleist is not a major figure in translated in translation in English literature. Um, so I, I, you know, as I say, I wanted to get the players on, on stage. Um, with The Broken Young, which was the first one I did, I wanted to sort of guy the Abbey Theatre and the Abbey Theatre tradition. So I set it in 1798, and all the villains in it are Irish. All the goodies in it are English. <laughs> I greatly enjoyed getting on Yeats's uh, Abbey stage, uh, a little bit of mystic making. It seemed to me uh, a good analogy for uh, Kleist's world, the world of 1798. Um, God knows Ireland is as strange as Germany or as ancient Greece. Um, and also, as I say, I just I enjoyed doing it. And, um, I love writing for stage, I love writing for actors. 
uh, my most thrilling moment was when I went to the first read, read through a broken jug, and I'd never been to a, a live event, a live rehearsal with actors, and it was extraordinary to hear the words I had written being spoken by flesh and blood people. Um, and I've been stage struck ever since. And uh, you know, one of the things that Lady Gregory used to say about when she was doing her her translations from uh, Moliere uh, into English, she said that the the difficulty was always making a language that she said would 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 kind of would cross the lights, you know, would 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 would, would get from the stage into into, into the audience, and that 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 kind of respected the the dynamic or oral quality uh, of of the. The theatrical performance. Um, when you were when you were doing the 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 the, the, the versions, is this before you you, you hear um, the, the actors reading the, the 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 script? I mean, was that um, a very conscious preoccupation of yours? That, that, to, well, to, I wrote I wrote them in blank verse. Um, the the mode of choice of Shakespeare and the other great English dramatists. Um, and Kleist, of course, writes in memory pentameter as well. Um, I wrote in a kind of doggerel, I suppose. Um, I didn't have the time to work up uh, sufficiently elaborated language for it. I wanted the urgency of Kleist, the immediacy of Kleist, to be apparent on stage. I wanted people to listen to the lines and not just let them wash over them, as most audiences do with Shakespeare. For instance, including Shakespeare's own audience, they can't have known what they were talking about. Uh, imagine the soundings listening to Hamlet going on and on and on. What can they have made of it? Um, so yes, I wrote in a kind of, let, let's not say dog, or let's say I wrote in a demotic uh, that would be that would be comprehensible. Mm. Um, one of the um... I mean, did you like playing around with with uh, anachronisms? I, I, th I think it's in the uh, God's Gift where um, somebody refers to the L Triangle uh, from Brendan Behan's The Querfel in 1954, which <laughs> they probably weren't seeing in, in 1788. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah, we're talking about translation, not about theatre. But, you know, I would simply say that my idea of theatre is essentially burlesque, um, is the... Uh, the um, Commedia dell'arte um, is, uh, is sort of circus. Naturalistic plays leave me absolutely cold. I could no more sit through an Arthur Miller play than you know, sing an aria from Tosca. Um, mm. I just find, you know, I, I, I watch and keep waiting for the lead actresses, Nick, to fall down on the set to collapse, or, you know, somebody to faint. Um, I'm constantly distracted by, but I love the rough and tumble of the circus of, as I said, the comedian or actor, uh, of burlesque. Um, that's what I wanted to write. I remember a friend of mine after <laughs> he had seen the broken jug in the Abbey. He said to me, "Why that play? Why 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 one play is that play?" I said, "Because it's funny." He said, "Oh." <laughs> um, I think a lot of people say it because. The, the combination of the names Kleist and Bandel, you know, are not exactly a, a hot ticket. Yeah, well, but they discovered to the basement that it was funny. Yeah, yeah. So there was it was that 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 kind of um, um, one of the uh, this is from uh, an interview I think that from a, a long time ago um, with uh, Hedvig uh, Schwal um, and you um, in Leuven. And, and you said, uh, nothing is translatable, really. Uh, I don't think anything has meaning in the sense that I define it. Um, the, you know, I, I know this is, this is back in 1997, so, I mean, it's, 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 it's many years ago, but um, I, do you... I, mean, well, I, still believe, I still believe it would be true, yes. Nothing can be faithfully translated. Look at Nabokov's translation of... Uh, Fusion on Jürgen, which is dead on the page because it's absolutely accurate. What you can do is take a text, a good translator needs to be an artist. 
and take a text, a work of art, and make it into a new thing in a, in a new language. Um, but you could not translate. I mean, how can you translate find God's we are that we must muster to a mortal must? You, you couldn't. If you did, it would be gibberish. Uh, what's the best that that translator could have done was to find a, you know, an equally obscure, contorted sentence in the language thing to, 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 that that translator was working. You see what I mean? You, you, you know, and you, you wouldn't want something translated absolutely faithful because it would be dead. Yes, yeah, yeah. No, you. It's it's a question of achieving a kind of an equivalent effect in in the other language, but using. Different sets I mean, when I'm when I'm reviewing when I'm reviewing a book, I I try at least always to make a point of mentioning the translator, saying you know, because this this is a, a new thing. This is uh, I'm reviewing it as if it were a book written in English, or a poem written in English. You know, I know it's not, but it has something has been done to it by some by the translator's rough magic. That foreign text, that foreign language text, has been transmuted into uh, uh, something beautiful and true in English. That's what translation is. Translation is not taking something over faithfully from one language into another. At least that's not how I would define it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that may be true of if you were translating a textbook or, you know, a business contract or something. But with with art, um, you have to remake the work of art in in another medium, in another language. Um, do you, talking about that, um, the sort of the, 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 the rough magic and, and, and what happens to, you know, languages when they get, get translated, um, uh, do you think that there's a sense in, in which one of the reasons why Translation is, is an issue that appears <clears throat> at various stages in, uh, in, in in Irish life. Is that you know the English that 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 is spoken here? I mean, what do you call it? Irish English, or Berno English, or whatever, um, is itself a kind of of translated idiom or an idiom that that hovers somewhere in a kind of translation space. Oh. Um, Absolutely. I feel that my books, I, you know, if someone says to me they read like something translated from another language, I'm thrilled uh, because I think that that's that we are. I think that even though the Irish language, well, I wouldn't say died, but used to be widely used in the 19th century, um, what we made of English was uh, a wonderfully rich medium. Uh, Hiberno English must be one of the richest literary media in in the world. Uh, look what we did with English. Look what you know from Johnson Swift up through Joyce Yates Beckett. Look what we've done with the English language. You know Beckett famously said that he wrote in French poor écrit à son style. But you only have to read a bit of it in French to see that it's as as um, I've forgotten who said it, you know, it's schoolboy French. It's perfectly uh, true and clear and, 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 you know, glowing in its way. But it's, but it's when he turns it into English that, that his work comes alive. Mm -hmm. Now, he would have disputed that hotly, of course, but... He would, yeah. <laughs> he was very proud of his French writing. You know, that was, yeah, he would have just... just, just but the French never considered him to be much of a French writer, you know? Nobody had the nerve to tell him that, but... You know, I've spoken to French writers. Uh, I knew Natalie Sarraud, who was in his own generation, and she didn't regard him as being any kind of good, good writer. <laughs> I remember talking to, to Natalie Sarraud uh, shortly after they won the Nobel Prize, and she said, oh, yes, we, we say in France, you know, he deserved it. And I said, well, of course, and she said, no, we say he deserved it. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, he he wasn't the, the figure in France that I think he thought himself to be. Uh, his, you know, in in in, uh, in one of the books, I think it's Malloy or Malone dies. He's wonderful thing in English, which is, he says, morning, morning is a time to hide. Um, they wake up hale and hearty 
their tongues hanging out for beauty, order, and justice, baying for their due. And the wonderful canine yeah. uh, background there, it's not there in French. Uh, and it makes that, I mean, that, that, you know, he's calling human beings dogs without doing it um, in that wonderful, elusive way that he did. It's not in the French. <clears throat> and I'm sure the, the same is true of, of many of his, of his more beautiful sentences. You know, he, he claimed, and perhaps he was right, he claimed to hate beautiful sentences, but he wrote an awful lot of them. Hmm. So you think it's... it's I mean, one of the... One of yeah. the things that that, that, few, that few people remark about Beckett is that he was a wonderful nature poet. Um, there are long stretches of prose, uh, which is pure nature poetry, absolutely exquisite, exquisitely beautiful. And I, you know, I'm, I wonder what that's like in French. Mm -hmm. I suspect it's not as beautiful as it is in English. Mm -hmm. And you know, again, Beckett was after beauty in, in both languages in many languages that he spoke. He said of Worst Word Ho, <clears throat> which was the worst title ever dreamed up, um, he said that, uh, you know, he said it was all, all for beauty, all for beauty. Now, not many of us would regard Worst Word Ho as his most beautiful book, but um, that was his aim. And again, I, you know, if the beauty is to come across in a translation, that requires the translator to be an artist. I don't mean that the translator has to be someone who writes beautiful books in French or German or Italian, whatever his or her native language is. But that the translator, when he or she comes to translate, has to be an artist or, I don't know, a translating artist. I don't know what the term would be. Without that, the work would be dead. Because I suppose one of the, 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 the interesting things is if we if we think about it, you know, uh, Irish English is this sort of language existing in this sort of translation space. Is that um, that maybe the the writer translator distinction begins to to break down in Ireland because uh, all, all writers are, are are translators of a kind because they're they're in this space, you know, maybe this shadow space between between two 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 languages. Um, well, I think that I, I have to be very, very careful here. I'm an old codger and I don't want to, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I don't want to talk about the young, don't know anything about them anyway. But um, from the little that I do see of contemporary writing, it seems to me that the younger writers and the middle-aged writers have given up the, the struggle with language. <coughs> They're now writing a kind of internationalized English, a basic English. Um, which is fine, um, but it's not what we did in my generation and the generations of Irish writers before me. We gloried in the ambiguity of, of our language. We gloried in the elusiveness of it and the elusiveness of it. Um, I would hate to see that die, but if it's going to die, it's going to die. Nothing I can do about it. So keep, keep writing my own and read all books and not must mean to more than must. <laughs> yeah, well, because what is interesting, if you, I mean, there are, you know, writers like Kevin Barry, Lisa McInerney, and so where it was a real, a real sense of, of that kind of younger writers that are, that we do sense the pressure of, of the, a very specific kind of, of, of language, a, a, a language from, from, from here. So maybe they're continuing uh, that on. But I suppose there's, uh, there's one other question that I, I wanted to uh, ask. Just, 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 just to follow up that point you made. Yeah. It is an absolute misconception that literary language expresses contemporary reality. It's simply not possible. This is a, you know, novels have never been relevant to their time. The great historical novels of the 19th century were all historical novels. Um, and in a way, in a certain sense, any novel written in the past tense is a historical novel. But it does not reflect uh, contemporary living. Recently, <coughs> excuse me, my voice is running out, that's soft for instance. <coughs> Recently, someone sent me uh, a transcription of an interview that I gave to her uh, some time ago. Long interview. And it's transcribed 
you know, I spoke. And it, you know, it's, 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 it's gibberish. I mean, I had to translate it back into something that could be, could be published in a, in a, in a journal. Um, we do not speak in English. Contrary to Moliere's character, whoever it was who said that he discovered he'd been speaking prose all his life, we do not speak in prose. We speak in a kind of broken jawed telegraphies. We have to in order to communicate. We couldn't speak. I mean, I could not speak as I write if I didn't. <laughs> well, I wouldn't be able to communicate. That's Communication on the page, entirely different to, to the spoken word. And, you know, everybody imagines that they can, well, most people think, you know, they have a book in them. Um, as uh, somebody said, who was it? Uh, said yes, you know, every man has a book in him. It's, just, it's not he who should write it. <laughs> of course, <laughs> that's what to stay inside. Um, uh, uh, um, you know, this is language. So it's just to, to just to reiterate, um, if people, if if writers imagine that they are expressing that they're in an unmediated way expressing contemporary reality. They're not. Language is coercive. I've said it many times and I say it again. I often think that we, it's not so much that we speak, but that we are spoken. Um, John, I'm going to just, um, we, 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 we finish up um, uh, with, with, with this question. It's just, we, yeah, that's that's come from a, a number of of of, of different uh, people who are kind of uh, listening in, watching us uh, this evening, and that's to do with um, other places, you know, foreign places. I mean, the, the the idea of of not so much linguistic tra spatial translation, but going to another uh, place. I mean, uh, has the the notion or the the, the idea of uh, being elsewhere, being in a foreign space, um, is that something that is a, a major, you know, uh, is, is important for you? And, and this could be, you know, in, in the, the, the foreign space of, of, of a painting by an imaginary artist <laughs> like Vaublanc uh, or a, you know, a, a specific place that's associated uh, with a specific figure like Kepler, um, or the 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 the, the, the book that you 2003 uh, Prague pictures um, is is no, is, no I, was, I, I was supposed to go to uh, to Poland when I was writing Dr. Copernicus before I wrote Dr. Copernicus, and I had got a visa from the Polish embassy in London. They didn't have an embassy here, and everything was fine. I booked, made my book my tickets and so on. Of course, the crafty Poles, what they did was they didn't send me the visa until six weeks after I was supposed to go. That was their way of keeping me out. So I had to invent Poland. Um, I had to invent these places. But, you know, when Nabokov famously, when he moved from Russia to America, he said, you know, here was my dilemma. Having invented Russia, I had to invent America. That's what a writer does. We invent a place. When I went to Prague, having written about Prague, I said, gosh, I did a good job. Look, it just looks like my Prague. Uh, that's what writers do. People used to come to me, and they still do, and they say how well I had caught uh, Poland in the 16th century, Prague in the 17th century. And I was always too polite, but I want to say to them, how do you know? You know, you weren't there any more than I was. They're giving me a much better compliment than they realize. They're saying, you've created a world that I recognize as a feasible, possible world, an imaginative space that I can live in for this, for the time and space in which I'm reading your book. Um, that's a wonderful thing. That yes. place is, I remember talking to Alberto Morabia when he was here years ago. He was writing, traveling around Ireland, writing, uh, sort of travel columns for the Korean Zansera. And he said, you know, I've been writing these travel things for a long time. And the, they always say to me in the paper, um, Alberto, you haven't told us what the food is like. 
So he said, so now I write every time he said, I went to the such and such restaurant, I had such and such, taste last spaghetti. <laughs> every time he said, taste last spaghetti. He said, they don't seem to notice. They just, uh, in a way, the world tastes like spaghetti. You know, it's the imagination that makes the world come alive, whether it's an unconsidered corner and, you know, disused shed in County Wexford in Derek Mahan's poem, or the Palace of Rajshani in, in Prague, um, the imagination makes it, makes it live. Uh, words, you know, are recalcitrant. They are limited. Uh, we have to combine them in such a way that they will conjure up a reality. It's very difficult, very wonderful thing to do, a great privilege to spend my life trying to do it. But we shouldn't imagine that what is being depicted in words is reality. It's not. It's an imagined world, an imagined reality. Well, John, I, I think on that, uh, uh, that tribute to the power of, of the, the imagination, um, which is what's the imagination of the the writer, but also the imagination or the imaginative capacity uh, of the, the, the translator. Uh, we'll uh, wrap up uh, our, our conversation. Um, I would uh, like, I think on behalf of all of us uh, who've been listening and watching this evening, like to, to, to thank you. Uh, I'm sorry you had to kind of deal with the, <laughs> the, 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 the technical um, black I don't man. believe a word about by the way, I'm convinced it's just you and me, and you're just lying to me about all those other people out there in cyberspace. <laughs> all be removed. <laughs> anyway, it was been uh, most uh, enjoyable uh, talking to you, uh, John, this evening, and uh, many thanks for taking. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it too. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Bye, John. Bye. 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 Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, I hope you'll agree that that was uh, a very interesting conversation. And uh, so at the Trinity Centre for Literary and Cultural Translation, we've run this kind of event often. And so if you would like to um, take part in future events, please do. Uh, you can find details of those events on our webpage, which is just on your screen just now. And you'll also find us on Facebook and Twitter and now you'll also find us on YouTube, so you can keep up to date with everything that we're doing. We'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.